Good morning. Kathy Fothergill here. Where is she? Oh, welcome back, Kathy. She got all her shots and she is back from the nursing home and we get to see her every Sunday again. And then there's, every once in a while you just need your mama. And Dottie Murphy's back with us too today. So, I sure love that lady. <clears throat> well, welcome to the live stream as well. Um, I've been encouraged by people all over the world, country, um, listening into Romans with us. And so we are praying for those who have reached out and filled me in on your journeys and what God's doing. So welcome to you as well. I believe that the time we live in will be characterized by a, a growing persecution and a, a reviling upon the church of God. This cancel culture has to do away with anything contrary to its thinking, and it's going to seek to silence the true church. And we will be turned in and put into prison, maybe even by family members. The cost to follow Christ will be exactly what he said. It will cost you your life and you'll be ostracized and reviled, and you'll be outcast in society. And then the church will be our place of solace and refuge where we'll come and we'll refuel for the battle. And it won't be forsaken by the elect, and it will become our lifeline, and it won't be about whether you got children's programs or contemporary worship or hip-dressing pastors and contemporary sermons. It'll be about, I just need Jesus or I won't make it another week. Open your word and teach me what it says at any cost. And what appears to be coming at us like a locomotive, unless God would grant a mass revival, we'll need each other to be the church to help us make it to the end in faith in Jesus Christ and not walk away like many in our day are doing. And so what I'm really enjoying is I see so many of you drawing near to God like never before. Great affliction has produced great affection in the saints of God here, and I love it so. I love what he's doing in your hearts. So here, here's my great burden this morning, is that a house divided will fall. We can fight an enemy without, but we need to stand together within. Um, our adversary, the devil, will spend much of his time on the inside of a church, which is why the scripture talks so much about why we need to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, to put out those who are divisive and causing factions among you. A little leaven will leaven the whole lump. And all around our country, um, the house is divided in many places. And churches are splitting and, and they're leaving by the droves. I spent the last year now uh, with COVID studying way more than I should have been researching, praying and ministering and listening and trying to keep our focus on what matters and seeking unity and how to best glorify God in the season that's upon us. And it's been really tough because it's, it's kind of like a moving target. And after a year of that, I, I've come to some clarity that I think can unify our house at Southside Bible Church, and even as I began, I just want to thank you. So many of you have just done this well, uh, and some of you this morning, I'm I'm asking God for repentance. We need to be able to join hands together and fight the right battle for another kingdom that will have no end. To bring many into this, as many into this kingdom as we possibly can with our our days, and to fulfill Christ's commission to go and to make disciples and to help each other through every high and stormy gale as we journey to home, to help each other to the finish line so that God will get all the glory. And so I'm going to say right out of the gate, I've been a Christian for about 34 years, and this has been the toughest season to discern what God would have me to do to be faithful in this time. And again, it was like a camera that would come in and out of focus. And so I've entitled this sermon this morning as just straight talk about our response to COVID here at Southside Bible Church. 
Uh, not pitting teachers that we like against each other this morning. I'm not looking for the sword of John MacArthur. I'm looking for the sword of the Spirit of truth. I, I want us to quit pitting. and just We're going to come to the Word of God, and, and we're a family, and we're going to ask God to unify us on what really matters. So I want to say this before we pray. I'm going to, I'm going to talk as straight with you as I know how. And I will most likely step on every toe in this room before I'm finished. I've been doing it to mine all week, so come join me, brothers and sisters. Let's have fun. James 1, we're to receive the Word of God with humility. I like the songs that we sang, Thomas, a humble king, and I want us to come and and receive the Word of God with humility. Because COVID has supercharged our hearts. And I think our culture has affected us more than we realize. We're going to journey in Romans to where he says, don't be conformed to this world. Don't take on the way it thinks and acts and treats one another. Be different. And that people are just ready to shoot. (laughs) They're ready to get angry and be defensive and cancel. So I just want to ask you to check your heart right now as we begin. God, let me receive your word in humility. And I got one goal this morning. Not to get you told, not to prove my viewpoint. It's just what the whole book of Romans has been about when we began this. Do you remember how it began in Romans 1.5? Paul says, I'm writing to you to bring about the obedience of faith. I want to, he closes Romans with the same statement. I'm writing this so that you'll obey by believing this gospel and living into it. That's what this is all about. For his glory, obedience of the faith. We've been saved for his glory. Our eyes have been opened that something bigger than my glory exists now. I exist for the glory of God. And my question for the whole year is what will bring glory to God in this day and age that we find ourselves? I just want to start with, is that your chief end? Is your chief end in this? How do I bring the most glory to God with my life in the midst of COVID? Or is it to be right? (laughs) I want God's glory. And if the Spirit through the Word of God this morning shows you what should be your heart in this, we're going to go to the table at the end. I'm going to let repentance begin with me. And I'm going to ask that I think there needs to be a lot of repentance in this body and forgiveness and to ask forgiveness. And dare I even say to love people with a different opinion. Wouldn't you agree that all of what we've seen in Romans so far is not so much what you do, but the motive and why you do what you do out of love? I guess what I'm saying, is there a chance, and I just want you to answer this before God, have you strained a gnat and swallowed a camel in the last year? If without love you're nothing, as we just heard in 1 Corinthians 13, Have you been so right in your stance while you're just destroying people all around you and being a horrible testimony? Where we've been journeying in Romans, I want you to hear where Paul's going to take it. And I'm going to read to you Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. (coughs) Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. (laughs) For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Please don't let that land lightly. The end goal of what God wants from his children is love, sincere love from a heart. The end goal of our instruction is that, and Paul wrote Timothy. So if you come to conclusions and actions that cross biblical love, you're straining a gnat and you're swallowing a camel. You're spending all your days judging everyone and looking your nose down, avoiding people with a different view, slandering, condemning, irritable, your spouse angry, You have missed what God wants from his people. 
And you can put your battery on your shoulder and say, I'm right, and just keep straining nets while you don't love one another. So the question is, yeah, but how do I love best and what is before us? Pastor, <laughs> we all differ on that. So how can we love when we differ what would be loving? This morning, every, there's probably split up. There's probably 30 different views. What's the best way to love one another? And so I dare say, if we cannot love each other while we sort all this out and journey, something's really wrong. I hear the self-righteousness in us. I will never let the government close our doors. You know what God says in Malachi? I wish that one of you would just shut the doors then this worthless religion of making offerings called sacrifices to me where you have no heart, close your doors. I'll never close the doors. Well, I will. If we won't gather in the spirit of Christian heart and what this is all about and the fulfillment of the law, it's not enough just to gather when you won't love each other as you come in. So if we can't love brothers and sisters in Christ, and I want you to hear this, who are one body, one Holy Spirit dwelling within us, who have one hope that we're going to see in Romans 8, one calling, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Oh, what we have this morning. And if we don't get this, then I do say we close our doors. I don't think the government should close our doors, but I think a lack of love should. If what unites us is how we think unified on COVID and our government, then we have nothing. If we have to agree right down the line on all of that, then, then we close the doors. Or we just keep making churches where everyone agrees, and you can go into all the denominations where they got 78 different ones, and uh, the free will Baptists, and you, you just, you get, every time you have a difference, you start a new church. So this is no small task that I take on this morning. So I just kept asking the Lord if I could wake up sick this morning, and I woke up feeling great. <laughs> so the, the wisest way to begin is what? You're going to get this answer. I know it. Thank you. Let's go before our God. Father, we come before you. And what I desire is true unity. Humans can't make it. They can't create it. You created it by the Son of God coming into the world and dying in our behalf, pouring out your Holy Spirit and granting us the gift of faith. Father, we don't create it. We maintain it. And I just pray now that you would take all of our journey and the word and that when we close out at this table, we would be one in every sense of the word. So I need you to do what no human being can do. I ask that you would create that in every mind and heart this morning, that there would be no uh, division in any heart. And so I pray on the holy ground of the communion table, that you would do what only you can do. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. If you're visiting next week, we will continue our study in Romans. This morning, I'm going to make application of our study. We've been in Romans for a year. We're going to review it now. <coughs> it's a book about the gospel. It's a book about how to come out from under God's wrath, as we learned in Sunday school and, and here this morning that uh, the wrath of God, you can't use hyperbole in how serious it will be. And there's a gospel that can bring you out of it and bring you into God's love and acceptance. And it can bring about the obedience of faith. And so chapters one through three, we saw the hopeless condition of humanity apart from God. And that's what we see all around us. And I, I pray that it's bringing out your compassion instead of your criticalness. The world is bad, dark, dying, and I just want you to look at it with the lens of Romans 1 through 3, 
and say they're slaves and they're under the wrath of God and I have the remedy and, and I'm going to go into it and love it and bring this gospel and not sit around just saying how awful it is. But now, God has done something and he's brought about a marvelous salvation. And we marveled at justification that because of Christ's work, every sin can be forgiven and the medal of honor can be pinned on you, and now you're declared righteous before God, as if you won the battle that Jesus won and you lived the life that he lived. You couldn't be uh, that approved by God this morning. And therefore, we exult in hope of what's coming. We exult in our tribulations. Keep squeezing God to produce more love and hope in me, and we result in our reconciliation that we have peace with God. In chapter 10, Paul's going to show us that this establishes our mission, and they need to hear. They'll never believe this without people who go and proclaim and speak it and tell this gospel. There, there's our unity. Go tell this message. And then we saw that this gospel broke the power of sin. You're joined to Christ. When he died, you died to sin. When he was raised, you were raised so that you can walk in newness of life. You don't have to live under the dominion of sin any longer. And last week, we began looking at verse 12 of chapter 6. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so you obey its lusts. You don't have to. Sin cannot take dominion over you ever again because you're under law, but under grace. <clears throat> verse 13, do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. And so last week we began looking at that Greek word, epithumia, and those again, they're your desires for good or bad things, and they're over desires. And these over desires will begin working and, and getting our members to, to go back to want to sin and, and, and go against God's will. And, and now this morning we're going to look at the application of that. So thumias our desires, and I want you to connect this one more time, for good or bad things, like submit to your governing authorities. Let's stop a disease that attacks the vulnerable. Let's social distance and put a mask on, and, and um, good or bad things. You, you, everyone differs on that even this morning. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? There's a whole bunch of views. Liberty and justice for all. How about I want my old America? I want the freedoms. I want leadership that fights for righteous things and protects the unborn. Some of you, I just want Donald Trump. And I still think it can happen. <laughs> it isn't going to happen. Just accept it. <laughs> That's an epithumia if you're still thinking it's going to happen. Okay? That's simple. I want you to hear this. Sin has no members of its own. And so it starts working on your desires. And all those things I said could be a good desire. <clears throat> it's going to try to make them an epi desire. And it's going to try to make it the supreme thing. And it starts to control you. And it's going to become this ultimate desire that I want more than God. My America will keep me up at nights anxious, fearful, and depressed. My freedoms will cause me to be flat out ugly and nasty to other people because it's so entrenched in my heart. It can cause me to make harsh judgments on my brothers and sisters, their motives. It can cause me to call elders cowards who are trying to obey the word of God can call people uncaring. Pastor doesn't care about my grandmother. Can cause you to be so afraid of death you're paralyzed. Can cause you to be rebellious. Can cause you to avoid people and even dislike them. That's what epithemias can start doing in your heart. So what could be a good desire has now become an over-desire. And now you're serving sin while you think you're serving God. Just study church history. People were killing each other over baptism, 
over communion and how to exercise government. Epithemius. And oh no, I'm standing for God. I'm standing for my great love for him. And John says, you can't say you love God while you hate your brother. Quit lying to yourself. That's what we call an epithemia. And that's what I'm after this morning. I'm coming after epithemias. I don't want to let epithemias break the unity of the spirit of what we have in Christ. Because I, I've seen them destroy families. I was talking with a guy this week, I think five kids, and these issues have divided their whole family. They don't even talk. It's dividing offices and neighborhoods and churches because they're so over that they're just causing you to be crazy. Have you noticed one thing? It's rare to meet someone who doesn't have a really strong stance one way or the other. And I wish you did have one, at least something. I just don't hear anyone say, oh, whatever. It's just loaded with emotions. Because epithemias got touched on during this season. And for me, mine was just when restaurants were closed. <laughs> that was not easy, and the coffee shops didn't help it either. Epithemias will cause you to use your instruments called the body to sin. And so as lo in love, as your pastor, I'm after your epithemias because they will destroy you and they will defame the name of God. But Romans 6.14 says, sin shall not have dominion over you because you're not under the law, but you're under grace. Grace will make epithemias Thumias again. And that's what I want it to be this morning, is I want you to have convictions and desires, but I want them to be Thumias. And, and the gospel of grace can do that for the good of your soul and, and the glory of God. So are you ready to start? Did you think I'd have a short introduction on just because I wasn't in Romans? And, and just a quick check before we start. Is anybody mad? We haven't even started. <laughs> and if you are, you have an epithemia. Romans 6.14, I don't have to serve these masters. I get to serve the master is what we've learned in Romans. What will that look like, Paul? I'm glad you asked. I want you to journey with me this morning. My prayer is that when we get to this in five years, you'll have forgotten everything I said about Romans 13 and 14. And I, I, I feel good that that's going to happen because usually weekly you do that for me. <laughs> so if you will turn to Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12 you know how much I like therefores. And this is where the 11 chapters of doctrine is moving. What should be my response to such a gospel? Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, and that I think we could study that word for years and years and years and not exhaust the mercies of God. Because of all the mercies of God in Christ Jesus, Present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to the world, <clears throat> but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is your good and acceptable uh, and perfect will. And so, offer up your bodies. Don't act like this world. God, here's my only response to your mercies. My life. And then in verses 3 through 8, Paul's now going to start showing what is that going to look like. And he shows that he's going to put gifts in the body. And in our unity, the body's going to work together and it's going to build each other up into the head. And then if you'll move with me to verse 9 of chapter 12. <coughs> verse 9. 
Let love be without hypocrisy. Quit faking it. <laughs> Quit letting it just be words and external. This gospel changes true love. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, squeezings, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints. And by the way, that has been amazing and beautiful during this season. Practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be the body. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. I got this whole thing figured out. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible... So far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy's hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Those are some beautiful marching orders for those who get the glorious mercies of God and all that he's given to us. Well, let's continue. What else will it look like for those who have been justified by the grace of Almighty God? Well, let's move in now to Romans 13, verse 1. <clears throat> Obedience of faith. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there's no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you'll have praise from the same. For it's a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it's a minister of God, an avenger of who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it's necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. I preached 1 Peter 2 in a similar passage a few years back. Do you guys remember that? Do you know what everyone in the church said after I preached that? Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you, pastor. I love it. Submit to your authorities because you're submitting to God. And we said it's an act of worship. I get to worship God by submitting to the authorities that he puts over me. How's that taste? What happened? Why, why'd you clap for it? I want to try and answer that after a year of watching and studying. When I die and stand before God, I want to be found faithful to my calling and charge to shepherd the flock of God. And that's all I can do is be faithful. And God will determine the fruitfulness of anyone's faithfulness. And so I'm going to start with just maybe how the last year uh, revealed epithemias in my own heart. I had a themia to love you guys, to teach you God's word and to counsel and shepherd and help you in times of trouble. I want you to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, when you finish. It becomes an epi when that eclipses God, when it becomes my identity. And on sabbaticals, you start to realize, you know, who am I? Child of God or pastor? When I can't sleep. When I'm anxious over the sheep. 
when I desire for you to appreciate my heart and not judge it. When I just want you all to be happy, I just, I love happy little sheep. I love it. God just took me to the woodshed. Families that I even led to Christ and loved and brought into my home during this time walked away and didn't even say goodbye. Differences on the elder board that we just couldn't get through. And we tried and tried. On Sunday, people who were once warm, you know, being distant and cold. I was called the pastor who's gone rogue. He doesn't care that people are dying from this. That's a horrible charge. And no matter how hard I tried to bring unity, it just felt like it was producing disunity. And so God just broke me. Don't you love that he breaks you? It's usually not just a little slap. He broke me. And this might sound weird, but it was the Sunday when we gathered and there was a thread out there for three years in jail and a lot of different things. And I had to stand up here and just say, all that matters is I want to be faithful to Jesus Christ at any cost. And in my own heart, my own conscience, I, I found such a sweet moment of worship, right or, if I was right or wrong, before God, that was a special moment. And the epithumia left at the end of it. It was to know Christ and to make him known and to be faithful to him alone and to give him his church. It's his church. It's his bride. And I didn't even know what I was doing. And there was a, a release that has been so sweet in my own heart. And I apologize for making you an epithumia because it harms and it hurts. It doesn't do you good. And now I feel like a healthy shepherd because my desire for you is unto my epithumia. Now, as I said last week, my heaven is heaven. And I can enjoy shepherding you because I'm not trying to get something from you that only I can get from God. Freedom. And I desire that same freedom for all of you this morning. So come pan for gold with me now. Our epithemia has to be God. It has to be Him and pleasing Him alone. That's what Romans does. So can we just start there? If we don't have unity on that, we have no unity. How do I do that, though, in this case? I'm just confused, or maybe I have too much clarity. So here's my best attempt. You ready? Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Quit beating around the bush, Pastor, and let's get after it. Here's where I landed. Two commands. I just read Romans 13. <laughs> your worship to God, your spiritual act of worship, offering up your body sacrifice is to obey the governing authorities that God has established and put over you. And so are there ever times that we're not to obey the governing authorities. <clears throat> and for sake of time, I'm not going to just write down 1 Peter 2. And in that, he talks about submitting to governments who are unreasonable. They're, they're overreaching. They're, they're difficult. In fact, Nero was in charge when that was written. He wasn't a good governor. A promise. He was killing Christians. He was martyring them. And so I just want you to see that, that there's going to be difficult governments and they're going to come. And first Peter, so, so not if we um, were to submit, and it's, it's not if we don't like to wear masks. It doesn't matter whether you like them or not. There will always be overreach in government. They'll always, they'll always be unjust, unreasonable. They're just seeing how much they can control us and pull a Hitler on us later. And I've heard everything from A to Z. 
But I want you to hear this this morning. This is your act of worship. Do you know what joy I have wearing my little mask to the grocery store, to restaurants? For me personally, it's my worship to Christ. I hate masks. I have asthma. And I get pimples on my nose if I wear them for more than two minutes. Christ, you are worthy. You're worthy of wearing a mask. The government, you know, if the government said global warming is if everyone wears tights, it will help it. And we're wanting you to wear tights. I'm wearing tights <laughs> because it won't get in the way of where I'm going to go next. I'll wear them. It's gross. <laughs> And those who wear them here on Sunday <coughs> and social distance, and you come in to worship your God, and I wear this thing, and I sing praises to my Redeemer, I just can't tell you how right that is. I just can't tell you how beautiful that is. The one thing I have not heard in this journey is that I love Mass. I have 10 that match my wardrobe of every color. They just look so cool. That isn't true. I, I've had one guy, he said, I got a big nose and masks are the best thing that ever happened to me. I get to cover it up. <laughs> Being under grace, hear this, allows you to not have epithumias that take over and they allow you to obey God with joy. Is there any greater joy than obeying God? Mic drop. And you all agreed with me two years ago when I preached that. And I love and rejoice in my elders and my brothers and sisters in this church who seek to worship God and obey him by following the mandates laid down by our government. I just receive you. And I want you to live by faith. And I'm blessed every Sunday when I see Someone doing that for that reason. It's not an epithemia, it's done by faith. You can wear it for a wrong reason, and I'll hit that in a second. So my question again, is there ever a reason not to submit to governmental mandates? And I want you to hear this. It's a second commandment. So that was a commandment. There's a second commandment in Acts 5. The apostles are preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. You fill Jerusalem with your teaching. That's my goal. They're put in prison. At night, the angel of the Lord opens the door and they start going out and preaching again. And the authorities come and say, we, we, we charged you to stop teaching. <clears throat> Their answer is, should we obey God or man? The universal command for any kind of submission to authority placed over us. I get to worship God by submitting to authority, and any authority over me that tells me to disobey God, I come out from under that authority. We've seen it with wives. We've seen it with, with governmental authorities. It's, it's a universal principle. With kids, you got parents telling you to sin against Jesus, your obedience stops there. We saw it with Daniel, bow down and worship the king. Moses, let's kill the babies. No, we're not going to kill our baby. So I want you to hear this. This is so important. We have two commands. Two commands. And I want you to catch that it's not two liberties. My freedoms. Whether I eat meat or not, sacrifice to an idol. This is what's been tricky in my journey. It's not some, um, uh, uh, your, your Christian liberty. It's commandments. That's what's bringing out epithumias, and that's what's going on in a lot of hearts. Obey the governing authorities placed over us by God, and when they command you to do something that God has commanded you to do, we humbly obey God rather than man, and we accept the consequences, even prison or death. And I'm just going to tell you right now, those who are bunkered up with your AK-47s ready to take on the government, that'll never be right. 
I'll take that on another day. I don't want to get off on all that. You accept the consequences. And I'm certain that we all agree on these two commands. This is what's made it so difficult. They're not amoral issues, whether you eat meat or not. They're commandments, and to not obey them then is sin. We're under grace so that God will supply the ability to obey them both at any cost. I I will obey it at any cost. The grace of God will, will give me that. So why has this been so hard on God-fearing people? If you believe we're under Romans 13, you're gathering this morning to worship God, and you're surrounded by people who are disobeying His clear command. As we sing praises to God, you just feel hypocrisy. And while we're singing, I close my eyes so I don't have to see this. I just want to sit in a section where everybody's obeying God. And how do I worship when the person next to me doesn't care that it might give me COVID or my aged parent? And what is more, the people without masks give me critical looks and make me feel like a leper for trying to obey God when they're my brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you see the battle? And if you believe we're under Acts Five, I need to obey God rather than man. You're here worshiping with a clear conscience and a heart that's singing praises to God. And it's hard on you because you feel that your brothers and sisters in mass are hindering the body, causing the growth of the body, where we need all the members to grow up into the head. And if I can't come within six feet of you, I just want to hug you and encourage you. And so you're struggling on the other side. And I'm frustrated because all of these, this is the other third group, I'm frustrated because all of these other people who are choosing to obey Romans 13, they keep breaking it. (laughs) And they hug each other and they stay more than five minutes after the service and it feels hypocritical. If you're under it, just stay under it. And they're saying, I got freedom when I realize that this mandate's keeping me from what God's called me to do, and they'll step out from it and come back in it for other areas. And that is what has kept me up at nights. Can we dwell together? Do we need two churches? Because this is not pick what you want to do. It doesn't make a difference. Well, no, this is the obedience of faith. So they're commandments and they're not preferences. That is what has made this so tricky. So do you, do you see the dilemma? So this, my friends, is why the body of Christ is falling apart all over the world, especially here in America, is because we have two commandments. And here's what has set me free and changed my understanding and ability to shepherd this flock and the unity of our elder board. Two commands. At some point, you cross from one to the other, right? It's got to cross at some point. There is a line (coughs) when you don't obey governing authorities. It's God's line. And our examples in Scripture, they're nice and neat and clear. Kill my baby, bow down and worship Joe Biden, quit preaching this gospel, which I think we're moving to some of these, and it's going to become a really clear line. So when you cross over the line from one commandment to the other, which is the same principle in both actions, to love God by obedience, that we have to agree on. So this is my burden as your pastor, that whatever you do in this is that you obey God from the heart. This is his commandment. You are following one or the other. Okay, that's where I feel like as your shepherd, I can't just let you flip around. I want this to be an act of worship to God wherever you land. 
What I can't accept is I just don't like mess. I won't obey a clear commandment of God because I don't like a mask. I'm telling you, you got to go deeper than that. And I would fail as your elder to let you journey in something like that. They're conditioning us for greater control. There's no such thing as COVID. There's no true threat. Yada, yada, yada. Is the government mandating me to do something that God has commanded me to do? That's the, the line. On the other side, am I just, I've had people say, I'm just a rule follower. I, I just follow rules. That's not enough. <laughs> That's called Pharisaism, cults. That, that's not enough. I'm so afraid of catching this that I have an epithemia that my fear has taken over. I got to shepherd you out of that. But goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. There is wisdom to protect yourself and your families, and there's a phobia that you can't let take over. But whatever you choose, the commandments, it must be worshiped to God with the obedience of faith is why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's what I'm after for every heart is that's why you're doing it. You worship this God and you obey him. Okay? So this is my point. The line that moves a child of God from one commandment into the other. So I'm going to keep doing these things. This is Romans 13. This is Acts 5. And I'm going to call this the conscience. So here we go. The line that moves a child of God from this commandment to the other can be subject to a different conscience as to when that takes place. So it's not a conscience issue. But when you feel that it's gone from this one over to here, there can be some difference in conscience as to when you think it makes that jump. And that's where we've been wrestling, studying, and praying. When is that? We've tried for a year to find unity in what that line is. And that's what we would follow. <laughs> so there's some possibilities that we all agree on that we would call civil disobedience. But we can't get harmony on whether that has taken place today or not. My personal conviction, and you guys know this when I got back from vacation in November, I just want to say I know that if your you know, wife is a nurse in the COVID emergency room, you're going to be seeing things on a daily basis. And, and when you're in the flock seeing suicidal thoughts and the battles, you're going to... You're going to have a different perspective because we're trying to get when does it cross and I, I had a flood of people coming to me who were just dying and drying up during this lockdown the body is to cause the growth of the body and it was killing us and when you counsel suicide prevention more than struggling marriages something's wrong I had a member close to 20 years here who tried to take her life and they came on Sundays during the initial lockdown begging me to come in because they needed the body so bad. And I had to turn them away because we would have had 12 people in here instead of 10. Singles who don't have families. I had people with tears saying I could handle anything if I just had my church. And at that time they were saying we need to have only 50 people in this building and wear a mask and have six feet apart and you have to leave right after the service and only two, two families in a house as long as it doesn't exceed 10. And what I can tell you in my own heart from being around close to 100 people a week is that the enemy I feel was deceitfully choking the bride of Christ and we couldn't let the body cause the growth of the body. And the toll was great, and I believe it is still great, and will continue to be, and we'll see the collateral damage as we journey. That's my own personal conviction. I don't make you hold that. Do I believe in the sovereignty of God? You better believe it. Do I believe that he's working all things for good? Yes, I do. 
Do I believe that hard times come for our good? Yes, I do. Do I believe that when I stand before God, he'll be pleased with what I did during this last year? I I do. And the fruit that I'm seeing from gathering has convinced me all the more that what the government was asking us to do was in contradiction to what God has called the church to do. And most of you were making the same decision day to day. And you would come out from under it as well. And so my opinion only is I have to obey my conscience as well, that I have to obey God rather than man and to shepherd the flock of God in which he's made me an overseer. So what do you do in a church with that? Well, you spend nine months praying, talking, loving, stretching, uh, I'm going to every godly leader I've ever known in my life and trying to get their insight and wisdom. And the one thing I learned is everybody has a different opinion on this. <laughs> so we have a leadership and a body that disagrees on which commandment we're under right now. But we believe there's room for differing consciences as to when and how that crosses over to obeying God rather than man. But where we all long is that every one of you would do it as worship to God and that you would obey him under that commandment. And I want to get rid of this stuff on the side. It just isn't right. Just throwing things away for things that aren't worship to God. And I want you, when you stand before him, to say, God, I obeyed your word. And and whatever one you land under is what we're trying to shepherd. And we have tried to give each conscience the ability to gather and stay at home and and do it while we journey this season has been what we've tried to do as an elder board. And so what do you do? Come with me to Romans 14 and we'll close out. Sorry, this sermon's going to go a little long. Thank you, Marty. Does anyone agree with Marty? Okay. All right. The right crowd's here today. Okay. If if you're not, I will not be offended if you get up and leave. You can pretend like you're going to the bathroom. (laughs) We are under grace again to follow Romans 14. If you've tasted the grace of God, here we go. And I, I want you to get this. And again, this is what's hard. This is dealing with commandments, all right? So this is what, in my mind, where it gets a little tricky. If it's just Christian liberty, Paul says, man, if me eating meat uh, stumbled a brother, I'll never eat meat again. And so some of you will be like, well, if it stumbles my brother, why don't I put a mask on and never, never go without one again? Because it's a commandment and not a, con- not a, a liberty issue. So I, I can't just say, my conscience says I got to obey God, and so I'm going to put a mask on so I'll never stumble you ever again as I'm disobeying God in my mind and my conscience. So because it's commandments, it's a little trickier. Do you, are you following me? If, if it's just your, your liberty, I'll give up any liberty I have if it will bless you and help you and not stumble you. But we got commandments, and I can't just throw a commandment away for the sake of the other side but I will throw a mask on for anyone that needs counseling and love and help afterwards. If you need me to wear one, I'll do it so that I can counsel you. But I can't come out from under this conviction. So, my first clarification then is there is room for a conscience to follow what command it believes we are under. There can be difference and grace needs to be given in that. And and the one other point, and we'll start, There's not a weaker or stronger brother in this, right? And in Romans 14, there's weaker and stronger brothers. And here, there's not a weaker or stronger brother. Which commandment are you under? And so that principle kind of goes away. But I want to show you the heart of how we deal with each other with this conscience difference on what commandment we're under. So let's go through it one time, and then we'll close out. (coughs) Romans 14.1. Now accept the one who's weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. 
The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats. For God has accepted him. Are you rejecting someone in the body of Christ that God has accepted? (laughs) That's powerful. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord's able to make him stand, whether he's under Romans 13 or Acts 5. One person regards one day above another. This is getting a little closer if it gets to the Sabbath here, because it's a command. And regards every day alike, each person must be fully convinced in his own mind how to be faithful to God, how to worship him under the command. And he who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord. For he who gives thanks to God, and he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat, and he gives thanks to God. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one of us dies for himself. Man, I pray that would be our hearts. For if we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. But you, why do you judge your brother? Are you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God on this issue. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and I'm convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, and it it will continue on. But here's my conclusion, is that the fulfillment of the whole law is to love. And the differences like we have before us this morning, as I ask you to study it out and, and get in the Scriptures Get counsel, meet with an elder, so that you can obey God from a clear conscience of which commandment. And you will give an account to God as to what you decide on this. And I don't have to judge you, and I don't have to look down on you. You you will stand without my conviction on this. Thank you, Lord. God's able to make you stand. So what do we do with the difference? Well, In verse 1, it says, receive one another. And again, that word was in, into close, intimate fellowship, into your family, is we receive each other, and we love each other, and we don't feel challenged by differences and, and where, where other people are at on this. And I'll tell you that, if we do that, the world will take notice. We, we are not in a church where you ended up with everybody in agreement at Romans 13 is where we're at, and you're not in a church where everybody believes Acts 5 is where we're at. Is that from God? Yes, it is. So we got to function together. Not all seeing, agreeing on this, we've tried that, but differing on which commandment we're under to genuinely love and receive your brothers and sisters and be so happy that they're trying to live out their faith in Christ by following their conscience to be pleasing to God in all of their lives and not to try to get each other to believe our view and not to be able to to walk in here. I'm saying to be able to walk in here with such differences and worship our God together as one. I believe that there's there's something more important in God-honoring than everybody waking up and getting on board and seeing the way I see this. We have an opportunity before us, but I think the world needs to see more than they ever in our divided America. And it's to see something different in the church and to see a people with these differences come together with one faith and one Lord and one hope. And we can come together and love each other and be about the bigger issues of, of how do we advance the kingdom in these days? How do we make disciples? And so we, we, we gather, and we're going we're gonna to join hands and redeem this time before us. And the harvest is plentiful. But workers who speak the truth in love and have the spirit of receiving one another are few to go out and show the world we have something that keeps us unified and to be faithful to the very end. And it's what we're going to go to the table now and, and remember of what unites us.
And so we will go to the table, and there's one thing I want to do before we, we go, is do you need to repent before God? Have you been condemning, judging, nasty on social media, not caring about people who lost loved ones, being insensitive, making, do you want, when you're finished with your life to be known, man, they got it right on COVID, or for me to live as Christ and to die as gain? What do you want to be known for when you finish? Have you been gnarly Charlie since this started? And is there a brother or sister, is there a family that's been divided up because of these issues? And this is where we come together on this holy ground. And we remember what, what matters. Christ Jesus died in my place to save sinners. And I can love my brother because he first loved me and what he did for me. And everyone who's obeying God by wearing a mask and social distancing as your worship to God, I am so joyful for you. And everyone who's not wearing one because you want to obey God rather than man. Praise God. And everyone who's doing it for lesser things, I pray you'd look at this cross and it would bring you to say, I want to please this God with every day that I have. So let's go to our God and we'll pray and then we'll take communion together. Father, I pray for this body. God, I thank you for so many have had this spirit through this journey, and I, I just thank you. That's from you. And I pray for any who have had a different, different way. God, as they look at the cross, that you would bring repentance. The anger that's been filling their heart will not achieve the righteousness of God. Your word says it makes them a defenseless city to the enemy, to epithumias controlling and driving them, or they can't even sleep. God, there's freedom in Christ. And what we're going to remember now is our blessed hope. And I pray, unify us like never before on wanting to lift high this name and this message and this cross. God, thank you. And I pray that you will bless us for your name's sake only. Amen.